Well, for more on China's infrastructure, I spoke to David R. Meyer. He's a senior lecturer in management at the Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis. I asked him how infrastructure spending is affecting China's economy. China will move into a more of a service economy gradually. That's already making that transition. But uh, the infrastructure is going to be necessary to keep doing it. And there, the other parts of the economic development process will be ongoing. One will be the transformation of manufacturing to much more sophisticated levels. So there's going to be that part of the economic development process that's going to be ongoing. So it's going to be a shift from um, the emphasis that has been in the past on the infrastructure. But that was part of that was very necessary, although it led to much overbuilding, as we now know. And economic development can be a costly expense. So what sort of progress are we seeing when it comes to private-public partnerships in infrastructure? Well, China has a, a public-private partnerships. They've been doing that for a long time. Uh, they're going to be uh, counting on that, of course, with the One Belt, One Road initiative. That's going to be an important part of that, although that's not often talked about. The One Belt, One Road part is, is China is expecting that private sector companies will sometimes even build the infrastructure on their own, or they will uh, cooperate, collaborate with uh, governmental units in the various countries as well as with Chinese government. So that's going to be an uh, uh, important part of all the development processes of uh, these public-private partnerships. But they won't necessarily be the whole thing. Uh, private sector is going to be stepping up, and China wants that to even do the projects on their own. Now, you say that that won't be the whole piece of the pie, just to have these public-private partnerships. What other sorts of funding, then, are coming into the infrastructure project? Well, the funding is going to be coming first from different uh, areas. Uh, various development banks are going to be uh, providing funds. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, of course, which is set up now to be a facilitator and partial funding of the One Belt, One Road projects over these next decades. But uh, China is also working in the AIIB or collaborating with uh, other development banks. In fact, on the first projects, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank to name two, have actually been partial uh, investors in some of the projects already, and that's expected to continue. They're also going to draw on other development banks like the uh, European one bank. Uh, there's a development bank there, and they've already participated also in uh, projects. So that's all part of the whole package, uh, of these multilateral banks, as well as the private sector, as well as the public-private, as well as government on their own, too. Now, One Belt, One Road, the initiative is supposed to cost, by some estimates, trillions of dollars. So how much infrastructure investment is China making into other countries in order to make this happen? Well, the One Belt, One Road is really a, a grand initiative. Uh, it's really going to be decades long. And it's a long-term development process that China is stepping up for the first time. Uh, the Central Asia, Western China, Central Asia, uh, other parts that uh, further west of Central Asia, that area is a very poor area of the world, also politically unstable. And China, with its One Belt, One Road uh, initiative, is really the first time a, a country has actually stepped up and said, let's do something about all these people. And so that's what's so important about it. But it's a long-term process that uh, China sees that. This is not going to be a one-off uh, affair. And the projects are already starting. Uh, they don't make much news, but they are already going on uh, all the way across that. Uh, individual projects, whether it's a dam project, a highway project, uh, power station project, and so on. And that's already appearing already uh, all the way across from uh, uh, Western China all the way to uh, Eastern, to the Middle East, and then some are even going to be starting in Africa soon. So as we look at these projects that are continuing to grow and flourish, what do you see as perhaps some of the untapped potential or other opportunities that could come with this? Well, I think one of the important parts, of course, is raising the economic development of this poor area of the world, which has been left out of development for the last two or 300 years. So that's the big uh, element of it. But not discussed much, at least I think, is in fact the unlocking the potential of much of the great resources that are in Central Asia, including in Russia. Russia is going to be a very important part and is an important part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. It was also a, a major contributor. Uh, it's the third largest contributor to uh, capital to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And Russia itself has, uh, it, the estimates are wild, so it's hard to say. I, I've seen estimates as high as $75 trillion of resources. And that resource base is going to become gradually more accessible for development. And that's going to be a major uh, factor in economic development in the latter part of the 21st century. And would you say there are any other potential headwinds that you see that could perhaps either limit or challenge China's infrastructure development goals? 
Well, I think the biggest problem, and Chinese leaders are well aware of this, is that these are mostly politically unstable countries, especially in Central Asia. So the political issues and conflicts are going to be an ongoing part of the, uh, the process. Uh, they're dealing with countries, even Pakistan, which is, has difficulties uh, politically. Uh, Afghanistan, as we all know, that has difficulties, and other Central Asian countries. So China's quite aware of, this, uh, of this, these difficulties. So it's going to, be a, it's going to tap the, the Chinese leaders' political and negotiating skills uh, throughout this whole process. And they know this. They're, they're, they're going in knowing all about that. So there's negotiations, and that's why it's going to be a very complex, long-term process. But the idea is to get these countries to step up and finally start to develop. And Chinese government will provide uh, assistance, leadership at times, but they're not going to dominate and run everything.